Welcome to the Swim Swam Podcast. I'm your host, Coleman Hodges. Joining me today, he is the head of digital content for USA Water Polo, as well as a sports broadcaster on NBC, ESPN, many more. Today, we are picking the brain of athletic savant, Greg Meskel. Well, I'm not trying to go that far. There's a reason why I'm here talking to you and not uh, training somewhere is <laughs> because I was not a very good athlete at all. So I decided to stay into a sport uh, by talking about it. should be the sports motto instead of those who can't do teach <laughs> it's those who can't do in sports talk <laughs> yeah those who get cut repeatedly from their high school basketball team <laughs> talk about sports now <laughs> i feel that so much i i got cut once in fifth grade and i was like i'm done with basketball it's just you know it's important to own it you know i, I i'm never going to pretend that i was something greater than i was so i love sports uh i love to play them still but it's fun to write and talk and do all that stuff about him as well. I'm, I'm in the same boat. Obviously, that's why we're having this conversation today. We, we, we roped Greg in uh, to, to be our water polo eyes and ears and to give us the rundown um, heading into these Olympic Games of, of our aquatic brother-sister sport um, because, because we don't have too many water polo experts on, and, and I'm certainly no expert on, on the sport. Um, can you give us a quick rundown of just what the teams are looking like, men's and women's, and maybe a few names that we need to know heading into these 2021 Tokyo Olympics? Sure. Uh, so when, when you look at water polo, it's a 12-team field on the men's side, and then new for Tokyo, it's a 10-team field on the women's side. That's up from eight teams, so slowly inching towards gender equity when it comes to the women's games. That, that's that's one of the big changes for this year. And then another big change is a small roster reduction. So team rosters are typically 13 per squad. That's still the same going into Tokyo, but now only 12 will play per day. So for a physically demanding sport like water polo, that's an interesting wrinkle to not have an additional player available. And then as far as the teams and, and the people to know, when you're talking about the men's side, historically, the former Yugoslavia dominant in water polo. So you're talking about Croatia, Serbia, those are your last two Olympic champions. Hungary for a long time, uh, the gold standard in water polo. They won three straight golds, uh, 2004 and 08. Uh, they're often the squads that everyone's trying to beat. Spain and Italy are, are also uh, strong uh, coming in, Greece as well. And then, of course, we'd have to talk about the USA men's team. They have not medaled since 2008, but a really solid young core. The entire group, one of the benefits of the pandemic for them, they went and trained exclusively in Europe. So they all got really great club experience, uh, including for the first time ever, an American male winning the Champions League. Ben Halleck winning with Pro Reco. That's a big deal. Uh, I've often, over the last couple of weeks, kind of equating him a little bit to Christian Pulisic for those that follow soccer and that you have a, an American player playing at the very highest level uh, in water polo. So he was one of four guys that made it to the final eight. And it's a team that I think a lot of people haven't seen a ton of due to the pandemic and then due to them being scattered about Europe, but exciting stuff going to Tokyo and that uh, they're a young group, they're super hungry and a little bit reminiscent of the 2008 men's Olympic team, the last one to win a medal in that they're not highly rated coming in, but they really could surprise some people. So that's exciting stuff on the men's side. And then for the women, it's been the U.S. They they have become uh, the greatest women's water polo program to, to ever do it, and I'm in no way overstating that. The numbers completely back it up. They are the defending champions in everything. They have won the last two Olympic gold medals, the last three world championships, uh, the last seven FINA World League Super Finals, the last two World Cups, uh, actually last three, excuse me. See, there's so many numbers you can get a little bit confused, but they're, they're a juggernaut. Um, they're a roster full of the best players in the world. They're the odds on favorite going for gold. Again, they had a 69 game winning streak that spanned uh, mid 2018 to early 2020. Uh, and I could just rattle off more and more accolades, but everyone is chasing them. Uh, the teams they usually find themselves against, Hungary has become a rival as of late. Historically, Australia is a team that they often meet when it comes to the Olympic games, Spain, uh, Italy, 
Greece, the Netherlands, all challengers. Canada is back in the Olympics in the women's game for the first time since 2004. They are chock full of NCAA athletes. 12 of their 13 have played college water polo in the U.S. So that's a little bit of a primer on, on kind of what's ahead when it comes to the men's and women's programs. And then, of course, we can we can get into some of the, the key names, especially on the U.S. squads, but a lot of talent out there. Yeah, absolutely. And I want to get into kind of the last quad for the men's and women's teams, because obviously it's looked very different. Mm-hmm. Um, in Rio, the men finished 10th. Is that right? That is. Um, and, and, and so, you know, obviously at, way out of the medals, they've kind of built, built their way back up. As you mentioned, um, they're a young core and then they just won silver in the world league. Mm-hmm. Um, and so how, what was that building process? Like the last four years was, was there a heavy emphasis right after Rio of, okay, something needs to change or was that more of a process? It's actually really goes back to 2013. So after London, you had a change in coaching. Terry Schroeder departs, goes back to Pepperdine. Dan Ardovicic comes from Serbia, a legendary program there. That Serbian team had won a world championship. They won Olympic medals. They'd go on to win Olympic gold as well uh, after Coach Ardovicic left to come to the U.S. And so you had a situation where in 2012, it was a veteran team for the U.S. They had hoped to kind of replicate some of that success from Beijing. Unfortunately, it didn't work out. They, they finished out of the medals, and then you had a lot of retirements after 2012. You have a new coach come in, and he really tried to open up the pipeline again of athletes that might want to get involved with the program while having some key veterans stick around from 2012. And so they had kind of a mixture going into Rio. Uh, it, it was a young team again. You had a lot of first-time Olympians. You had a couple of key pieces left over, like a Tony Azevedo, a Merrill Moses, uh, John Mann, Jesse Smith, a couple of names there that were part of that 2012 and even going back further. And uh, like you said, and it's tough when you look at finishes and team sports, even a 10th place finish and and not to make the result out better than what it was. It was nowhere that they wanted to be, but it just takes one bad quarter, a, a tough game here or there. And so they were, they were in a lot of their games, uh, just couldn't get it together in group play to then try and advance and get a little bit further in the tournament. And and so they, they finish where they do in that uh, 2016 games, but then you have even more retirements after that. Mm-hmm. So now you have Tony Azevedo retires, Merrill Moses moves on. And then the other interesting thing was guys that I think the coaching staff thought would continue on to become a, a two-time, a three-time Olympian. Some of those guys were one and dones. They just did the one games. They didn't come back. And so that hurts a little bit on the development side because this is such a process, right? You're building towards, you know, maybe not even your first Olympics, but gelling together for that second one or that third one to go back to the 08 team. That was a group that had been together for years and years. And, you know, finally in 2008 is when they got their medal. So uh, it wasn't a complete rebuild, but you're looking at a roster now going to Tokyo that is eight first-time Olympians. So based off the amount of first-timers you had in Rio, that math probably shouldn't check out, but you had people that departed, new people that came in, and then a couple that stuck around, right? Five returners. The veteran of that group, Jesse Smith, headed his fifth Olympic Games for the U.S. team. So he ties Tony Azevedo's record for five Olympic Games, the most uh, for anyone ever for for a USA water polo squad. And uh, so, yeah, a little bit of kind of a second build coming off of Rio, um, but a group that is super dedicated to the cause. And I think that was emphasized by them going to Europe. So that's not an easy thing to do, to to go abroad, immerse yourself in a new culture, learn new teammates, a new style of play. But 19 guys of that training group went to Europe, played with clubs in Greece, Italy, Montenegro, Hungary, to try and get better and to get high level competition. And so that's really the wild card for me, for this group is they've gotten this big time game experience that didn't happen before 2016. Some people played pro, but not to this extent. And so for everyone to get those high stakes opportunities, and then like you talked about Coleman, the silver medal finish at the World League Super Final, those are some positive trends for the men heading into the next Olympics. Yeah, and and for those for those of us who don't know, obviously I'm well versed. I'm not, but <laughs> the World League, you know, we we yeah. they won silver at the World League. What does that mean? What what is so, the World League for water polo? 
Yeah, the World League is is the second most important event in any given calendar year. So this year, you'd have the Olympics being your best event and then the Super Final or the World League being the next event below that. And next year, the same thing. World Championship will be your most important event. And depending on the scheduling, because it's in a weird time next year, Worlds, due to the pandemic. But if they can have Super Final, that again would be your second most important event. Uh, and and really, it is what it kind of sounds like. It's a league, right? And so it's divided up depending on where you're at in the world. So there's the Americas part of it. There's the European part of it. There's other areas. Typically for the U.S., we don't play much of a World League schedule. Uh, you qualify for that super final, and that's kind of the extent of it. And then you go and play. Sometimes there are America's qualifiers where it'll be an event with Brazil and Canada and maybe Argentina and the U.S., and you'll try and play that and then advance the super final. But typically spots are confirmed through other means. And then in Europe, they do play a bit more of a World League schedule leading into the super final. So um, it often brings together a pretty good showcase of top teams in the world, but it also depends on the year. So for example, in, in this year, and this is not to diminish the result for the men at all, but uh, not all the Olympic teams were in the super final. So it wasn't the complete field you'll see in Tokyo, and it's a smaller event. It's only eight teams as opposed to 12, but it wasn't all the all the top teams from, from Tokyo in the super final. So still a fantastic result, a great semifinal win over Italy, a very close finish against Montenegro where they were right there to win it. Um, but it depends on the year to kind of look at that field. It's like any tournament or any meet, right? Who's entered, right? Who's going to be in this thing? And then we can gauge our result off of that and also our chances of success. So uh, a great finish, hopefully boating to a better finish or something on the podium for the men in Tokyo. And, and that's a great look at, at the U.S. men and the men as a whole heading into Tokyo. Um, so for the women's side, obviously, as you said, U.S. women are just dominant and have been for a long, long time. How, how do they maintain that, right? How, how do they just keep, uh, especially with, with a sport that sounds like it, it does have significant turnover, how do they just keep dominating and dominating? It's such a competitive environment to just make that team. And we've talked a bit about international play and club play and so whereas in men's water polo, if you're trying to play amongst the best after college or even during your college aged years, you know that Europe is the is the end of the road, right? That's where the highest level games are going to take place. Conversely, in, in the women's game, if you want to play in the best league in the world, it's the NCAA. That, that's the highest level of organized women's water polo right now. Now, there are some good leagues in Europe as well. And I, and I think that gap is closing. Some people might say that's not true, right? There's there's better water polo in Europe. And I think the gap is closing for some of those competitive club games in Europe as well. But you talk about some of the best women's international players, they come to play in the college system. And so that level of play, there's obviously a home field advantage here. If you're a US athlete, right? You're already around the college game, you're seeing it. If you're playing water polo high level domestically, odds are you're going to go to college. And so you're getting that experience. And so these athletes are getting high level competition from the jump. They are able to see that this team is a competitive one. Winning obviously breeds success. It also encourages others to get involved, right? People want to be part of a dominant program. And, and so I think they've just created a culture where it is highly competitive, where people want to be a part of, of this system, where they never rest on their laurels, right? So as good as they have been, you never get a sense around that team that they're complacent. You almost have to drag their compliments out of them, right? They don't wanna talk about all the wins all that often and all the gold medals. And because they get asked the question all the time, right? So you take someone like Maggie Steffens, the captain of this team. Okay, you've won all the things on earth to win. There's, there's nothing left. There's no other boxes for you to check. So why are you still doing this? And that's a hard question to answer. Right? Like what, I don't know what I would say to that. Um, and her answer typically, right, is the dream remains the same. So just because I've done this thing, just because I accomplished my dream of being an Olympian, being Olympian, being an Olympic gold medalist, doesn't mean the dream changes. I just want to do it again and do it better and do it with a different group of people. And so uh, I, I think they, they just never get tired of, of chasing excellence and of figuring out ways to get better and of challenging themselves. And that's been the evolution of this group. 
if you go back to the start of women's water polo in the Olympics in 2000, they were kind of the underdog squad that people didn't think would even make the Olympic Games, let alone medal. They win a silver, and that started a run of them meddling in every Olympics that have ever offered women's water polo. They break through in London. They win that first gold in 2012, but it wasn't a cakewalk. They had to battle it out in overtime in the semifinals against Australia. They had a tie game early in group play. So it was not an easy walk to the top of the podium, but they won that gold. People came back and then Rio was where they just showed the world what a, what a force they can be. So, you know, what's the evolution of that? We're about to find out here in a couple of weeks. How do you, how do you build off of excellence? And that's, that's really been their quest, right? To not get complacent, to not take their foot off the gas pedal and to keep pushing forward and dominating in new ways. Yeah. And I, I had a podcast with Maggie early, very early on in, in the pandemic. I think it was maybe in April of 2020, mm-hmm. um, but haven't, haven't had a water polo check in since then. So I'm curious, you, you mentioned the men went over, a lot of the men went over to Europe to train during the pandemic. Was that similar for the women? Or uh, as you said, because the NCAA is here, did a lot of those women stay here and did even, you know, foreigners flock to the U.S. as well to try to train? It was actually the exact opposite of what the men did. And so the women stayed at home. They trained in Los Alamitos, California. They were out of the pool for a little while. Uh, for some of them, I think the longest they were ever away from a pool since they were little kids and learned to swim. I think a lot in the swim community felt that way, too. They quite literally fish out of water. I right? didn't know what to do. What am I supposed to do on land? I don't, I don't want to go for a run. So uh, they were out of the pool for a while eventually got back in and then just kept training with themselves. The college season for the women, it was wiped out in 2020 and then it eventually came back in 2021. But at that point you're in residential training for the Olympics. And so typically uh, the women's team wouldn't have competed for those that are college eligible, they wouldn't have competed anyway. So they kind of just kept their head down, kept training. It was a lot of time amongst themselves. They really got to a point late last year, early 2021, where they were just dying to go anywhere and play anyone but themselves. Pandemic scheduling, we all know what this has become. They had things lined up, then they would fall apart. They thought they were going to meet up with Hungary in December, then it didn't work out. They thought someone else was going to come at a different point, didn't happen. Eventually, early earlier this year, they went to Hawaii just for a week of training, just I think to be somewhere different, just to get a change of scenery, stop being at their facility for so long because remember now the pandemic arrives in march 2020 in in their minds they're in the home stretch this is this is the end of what had been a ton of training going back to 2019 they'd really been together since early 2019 through the summer worlds and kind of kept after it there into the fall and so uh to think that you have to kind of continue on and prolong this journey so many Olympic athletes had to figure out uh, it's quite a test. So they get to go to Hawaii earlier this year and then things start to open back up. They host Canada, they host Hungary, they go to Spain, they go to Greece, they host Russia. And and that's really kind of been their path. So a lot of time at home, not the typical travel. And I think both teams and almost all national teams going to the Olympics have run into this problem. Not the same amount of games. You would typically at this point have played I don't know, 35, 40 matches going into the Olympic Games. The women right now going to Tokyo south of 20 games played in this calendar year. So there just hasn't been the time to understand what your team looks like. And it's like anything, peaking at the right time. So I think that's that's a big question mark for a lot of these teams too. Uh, what, what will we actually look like when it's go time in Tokyo, knowing that we haven't had all the typical amount of preparation and evaluation we would have liked? I'd, so that that raises a, f- a few good questions and a few logistical questions that I'd like to get from you now that we have you here. For those of us who may be water polo novices, <clears throat> first of all, as a, as a water polo player, as a water polo athlete, how do you make the Olympic team? There's 13 spots, as you said. Uh, what is that selection process like? Obviously, I'm guessing it's a little more subjective than maybe swimming, where, where top two go and that's that correct it is a very very different uh it is not as clean cut as i i make the certain time i'm in right um and it's a situation where you're always trying to make the next roster so i think that's a a bit of a misconception and i know the athletes deal with this a lot where they make 
the Pan American Games, or they make the World Championship roster a year out from the Olympics, and a lot of their friends and family are like, great, we'll see you at the Olympics. And they're like, no, not at all, actually. I still need to make that team. So it is constantly a, a situation where you're being tested. Uh, it's it's long-term evaluation, right? There's, there's a coaching staff, high performance department, all that sort of thing um, that are looking at the athletes over a long period of time. So it's not just one game or one moment that makes or breaks it for an athlete, but it's the sum of all their work. So you think about the start of a new quadrennial, typically four years, in this case, five. But after that Olympic Games in Rio ends, the coaching staff is now looking towards the next Olympic Games, kind of in the distance, but you have a bunch of little checkpoints along the way. So again, we talked about your major events in any calendar year, two at least in any calendar year, your super final and then something else, right? Your world championships, your world cup, whatever it might be every athlete has to battle to make those rosters. And so I think you're trying to hit those mileposts along the way. I I make this roster, then I make that one, and then I make the next and the next. Now, if you see the same name showing up on all of these rosters as we go along this journey through a quadrennial, odds are that person makes the Olympic team, but it's also not, not an absolute lock. You've seen people make a roster for Worlds a summer before and then not make the world championship. You know, when it comes down to those final few places on the team, I think it becomes a very difficult choice for the coaches and you'll see them try out different rosters in the events leading up. Okay, let's go with these 13 and see what we get for our worlds. And then maybe we'll tweak it with these 13 for our Pan Ams, or we'll go here for super final, that sort of thing. Um, and and again, it is a, uh, it's just kind of a cumulative thing over time where there isn't, and I think this is the hard part for team athletes across the board in any team sport, where there isn't a clear-cut mark to hit. That's actually the beauty of swimming and of track and field and of these sports that are timed, where it's clear, I I just got to win. I just have to come in second place. I just have to make this time. I know what I'm training for, right? I just need to get here, and then I get there. And that's not how this works. And that, I think, is is one of the ultimate challenges because it can become a mental game, right? Am I doing all the things I'm supposed to be doing? Is this what the team needs, right? And I think you see people too that make teams, it's not an all-star team. It's not uh, always the dream team in basketball, right? Where you just assemble and that roster has gone through their fluctuations. I think you've seen over the last couple of years, the last couple of Olympic cycles where they've really honed in on picking a team that's gonna work well together, right? As opposed to just seeing who, you know, who might wanna take part. Uh, and it's the same thing, in water polo and a lot of other sports, you need to assemble a really strong roster of people that are going to be able to get this job done, not just the ones who can fill up a stat sheet. And I I think both U.S. squads have examples of that. If you looked back to the the college career uh, of someone like a Kaylee Gilchrist, for example, on the women's team, never won a Catino Award, which is, you know, the water polo's version of the Heisman. Uh, as 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 the best player, uh, you know, never even a nominee, as far as I could tell, was you know was a really really good player, right? But was not coming out routinely, you know, dropping six goals on on people every game out. But f- fits what this team needs, right? And has gotten better as time has gone on. And I think you see a lot of people like that in the water polo world, where they find their role. Uh, you know, the Olympic team doesn't doesn't need. 11 men or women to score all the goals, right? They need other pieces to fill out the roster. Uh, And and so that's a long way of telling you, right? It's just, um, it is an interesting process and one that is uh, a challenge for all the athletes and the coaches. And they're looking to build that team that's going to give them the best chance over over a two-week tournament. And obviously the water polo athletes and coaches know this is coming, are used to this process as a swimmer. That sounds awful. <laughs> I, w- I would hate sure. to be in that process, but again, they, I'm sure they're used to it. Makes sense in a team setting. Well, and it's different too. You get to this level. If you're at this level, you have progressed through life so far, making all the teams probably pretty easily. Not only making them, you probably start and do the bulk of the heavy lifting. Okay. If you have gotten to this national team level, yeah, and e- even college you're recruited to play and and this is the funny thing about the national team too right college they they want you right 
please come here, join this team. You're on the roster. Your playing time might waffle back and forth, but provided you're you're a good member in good standing, you're on the team. You're not you're not going anywhere. Mm-hmm. And then it comes the national team, and now it's you want to be a part of that. You know, in some cases they would certainly love to have you, right? But you have to prove you belong. It's it's really the flip of the whole recruiting thing from college where now it goes the other way and you have to really prove yourself that you should be part of this because everyone wants to be part of it. That's a good point. Yeah. And I, uh, again, I, I don't think about that for swimming because yeah. it, you just make the time and then you're, yeah. that, that's how you get on the national team. Yeah. That's, that's really interesting. Um, and but so, I mean, even with swimming, right. You still have to want to do it. There's no shortage of people that would happily take, take your spot. If you didn't feel like putting in the work, to go and then earn the times, right? Someone else will happily just, you saw the trials this year, right? There are plenty of people that would happily have been like, yes, please move me up one. I will take the spot. (laughs) Very true. Uh, Very true. It's so moving forward from that, getting to the games. And I know this is going to sound like it's, do I, I I don't know anything about water polo. And so since we're doing this, I want, I want our audience to get the full scope. How does the tournament work? once you're at the Olympic games, what's the format of, 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 of it. And how do you win a medal? Yeah. Uh, so it runs the entire time. Water polo really starts right after opening ceremony with the first women's game and then, uh, alternates. So men's competition, then women's and we alternate back and forth until it's done. I want to say the last men's game, the gold medal finals, August 8th. And so wow. if you're following Olympics. You, you have a chance to see water polo pretty much every day. Uh, it starts out in group play. Te- teams are broken out into two different groups, right? So, so group A, group B. You play who's in your pool or who's in your group. You you vie for standings, right? Uh, to to finish, you know, in the top part of your group. Then you have a crossover. So it'd be something like, and I, I don't have the schedule in front of me, but something like the first in A group would play the third place team in the B group in kind of your crossover, right? And then that crossover is is huge it's monumental right okay. that's your uh i guess that'd be kind of like your prelims to get into the finals right at trials right like you you can't be in the mix if you don't get into the mix so you have to make sure that you advance to get into the semis to get to that next round right uh past your past your crossover uh, and then you'll have yourself an opportunity to play for a medal right and if you don't then then, then you're on the outside looking in so Really, when you come into an Olympic Games, it's like you're looking right in front of you, but then you're also looking a little bit in the distance because you know you have to perform well in your group to at least have a chance to take on another team in a crossover. So you have to execute there, especially uh, with the men. You know the bottom teams drop out, so you don't even get a chance to get into that next game. Uh, and then you also are kind of keeping an eye: what are they doing on the other side? because that's who I might play in this very important game to keep my tournament going. And so that's, that's, that's really kind of how it shakes out. It's, you can afford to lose a game, uh, but it is not recommended early on, right? So, uh, you, you know, you can drop something early typically and then route your way back and still win a gold medal. You only have that luxury though in pool play. Uh, and so, you, you know, you really are looking at that schedule and your group and your draw and plotting, you know, how will this go and, you know, what what can we do? And for both U.S. teams, and this is interesting now with no fans allowed, it was going to be a different wrinkle, I think, when there's only going to be local fans. Mm-hmm. But both U.S. teams open with Japan in Japan. But uh, that would have been an inter- a more interesting environment, I think, with a very pro home crowd, uh, just kind of the energy around it. And so I think as an advantage to the U S there's going to be a little bit of, of the air taken out of that balloon when they open up. Sure. Yeah. It, the, the, I mean, the no crowds has been something we've been covering for a long time. I, in water polo, the heads of our heads are above water. So I'm guessing crowds make a pretty big difference. Totally. Yeah. You can, you can hear that and feed off the energy and water polo is a sport where it is very popular in certain parts of the world and not so popular in others. So I say confidently, every one of these athletes has played in front of a ton of screaming fans. And they have also played in front of absolutely nobody where they have been able to play where they could hear the 10 people that are there hanging out, or maybe the team that's waiting for their next game. 
Uh, there have just been some tournaments where if you're not the local team, the fans aren't showing up, you know? So, so we've seen this even in the U S we'll host an event and for the U S game, everyone is excited, but at 3 PM on a Tuesday, not a big crowd for Kazakhstan versus Australia. Right. Understandably. So no offense and none taken, right. It's just the way it kind of works out depending on who the fan bases are. So I think they're used to a little bit of both for those that have been to an Olympic games, it's going to be strange. I think they're used to the energy Olympic events, even if you're, you know, not a, a big water polo person, people just get tickets. They just go to things just to, just to see them typically at the Olympics. So there was, there would always be a crowd. And so that'll be a very, a very different feeling when these games start. Are, are there, what are water polo fans like? <laughs> Do they get rowdy? <laughs> Again, it depends. I, I, you know, not to just constantly lump those from Europe in with European soccer fans, but there are some similarities, right? Where there are a lot of, you know, the yelling and that sort of thing. And uh, for those that have played, you know, chance, for those that have played club water polo, uh, some of those environments are intense, right? Small indoor pools, uh, raucous crowds, you know, heated rivalries, you know, two two teams, same area, that sort of thing. Uh, and then in, in the U.S., if you played with the national team leading up to the Olympics or if you've played in an NCAA final, uh, really, really passionate fans as well. You know, loud, cheering, fired up, uh, understand the sport, you know, so really kind of hanging on those moments. You know, that's always interesting, too. And, and this happens sometimes at, at international events. You know when someone the crowd understands what's what's going on. I, mean, I think everyone understands ball and net means goal, but the other little nuances of the game, right? Uh, you know, a water polo audience is, is more tuned into, oh, that's an exclusion. It means the team will go up on a six on five or a power play, whereas maybe the average sport fan doesn't really get that. So I think you you feel and hear that emotion too. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I, I, <clears throat> that makes sense. It, it sounds fun. I don't, yeah. I, I'm trying to think if I've ever been to a water polo, polo game. I don't know that I have, but now it's like, wow, I, I need to, this is something I need to pay attention to in the, in the coming weeks. Yeah. I, I would say, I mean, obviously certainly tune in. And then uh, if you have an opportunity to go to an NCAA championship final, you know, this, this fall, the men's season is back on. And, you know, I think expecting fans at all their matches and uh, the NCAA championships coming this December, I believe they're at UCLA. Uh, that that'll be a great a great environment for water polo to see to see high stakes games and you get a, a USC versus UCLA or a Stanford against Cal that's that's really high energy stuff. Oh man, I can imagine. Uh, I have one final water polo question. Sure. Which is, you mentioned you want to peak at the right time, and I'm always curious about this for team sports, but you know, obviously for for swimming for track and field it's like we have taper you know you, mm -hmm. you 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 come down and then you try to race your fastest what what is what is peaking at the right time mean for a water polo team and is there a resting process for that at all well there certainly is a ton of swimming in water polo i think most people get that but there's also a lot of swimming in the training for water polo so mm -hmm. often a typical water polo practice for the national team you're talking about being in the water probably six and a half, seven hours a day. Uh, and usually it's broken into two chunks. So three and three, something like that morning and afternoon. And sometimes that morning is, is really just a lot of swimming and conditioning, maybe, maybe some long course, that sort of stuff, uh, treading, just really grinding it out in the water. And then maybe the afternoon is a bit more of your tactical stuff. And it kind of depends, you know, that's kind of the women's schedule. The men sometimes would go, maybe a longer block in the morning, you know, four, four hours in the morning that might include some weight room and then go for two hours in the evening. So it just kind of depends on the coach and the staff. But I, I think a little bit like uh, elite swimming, you're not going to have the crushing swim workouts as you get closer to the Olympic Games, right? So you want people fresher. I think it becomes a bit more tactical, the water polo practices as you get closer, really drilling those plays, right? We want to be perfect on our six on five, which is, which is a power play in water polo. It's a, it's a huge part of the game, right? You have your, your player advantage. You want to be able to execute there and, and just know that like muscle memory, where you're not even thinking twice about where to be, uh, w working on other tactics, uh, counter attack, uh, things like this, right. That are very, uh, germane to water polo that are just important parts of preparing for high level games. So I think that, and then I think 
other games, competition, wanting wanting to be executing at a high level as a team. That's something all these teams are looking for. And that's why you see a lot of competition leading right up until before departure, trying to get that super final, then trying to host other common trainings, go to other countries, play other teams, get yourself into a rhythm, especially this year where you haven't had that opportunity to be together, uh, all the more important. So looking for a good number of games so that you're just well rehearsed, you know, think of it like a, I don't know, an orchestra, right? That kind of all works well together. Uh, they want a lot of practice time and kind of a lot of simulation of the real thing before the audience shows up to hear what they're about to do. And so I think that's the same thing for water polo, uh, but, but it's that right balance, not too much, right? Not everyone burnt out. And so you see a lot of that. And then I think you see things kind of uh, dialed down a little bit right before they depart. And then they'll do, you know, typically both teams and the U.S. teams are doing this. Uh, the men are training, the U.S. men are training with Australia uh, in Hawaii before they go to Tokyo. And the U.S. women are training with the Netherlands in a different part of Japan before they start competition. And so you get that little bit of common practice and uh, no no official matches or anything, but a little bit of that competitive nature in practice, kind of your final thing. You know, if you've ever seen a, before a boxing match, right, they maybe do a couple of quick sparring moves or kind of hit the hit the bag a few more times before it's time to throw on the robe and walk down the aisle. That's like what this is before it's time to actually start this thing. That is so cool. I, <laughs> I, I wish we did that. Like we, this swimming has just finished their Olympic training camp in Hawaii. Now yeah. they're headed to Tokyo for like their, their last few punches on the bag. Mm -hmm. but the, like the thought of, of our Olympic team training with Australia in the lead up to tr like the Australian Olympic team in the lead up to the games would be, would be so much fun, you know, or, or something like that, where it's, yeah. you're training with different teams and you're, you're getting that new stimuli. And, and then you go head to head with, pe with, with these people who are your arch nemeses within the sport. That's it's certainly something that's I don't think ever really happened in swimming before, but that's really cool that water polo does that. And it's different too, right? For water polo, you're talking about you're gearing up for this whole tournament of competition, right? So it's uh, a couple of weeks of of play, multiple games. Swimming, it feels a little bit different. I know some some do multiple events, but in a lot of cases, right, they just need to kind of make sure they qualify for the final. So it's like you got to execute, you know, twice and then make it happen. And that's, that's really where you're working on, right? So it is a little bit more of a thing where you want to kind of save your energy and be ready because you just need to empty the tank mm -hmm. twice or four times or whatever, however many events you're in. Yeah. That, and that's a great point as well. Uh, it, I, that brings me to our final point, which is you, you have uh, knowledge in not only water polo, but quite a few sports. You, you've been broadcasting sports for quite a while now. Um, you, you go to these summer Olympics, but then you also broadcast during the winter Olympics. And I, and I want to start this topic with that is, is comparing a winter Olympics to a summer Olympics. Obviously the sports are much different. I'm sure the cultures are much different, but you see, you see one side of it, um, with the team and then kind of another side of it from the broadcasting side. Can you compare and contrast viewing, viewing sports from those two lenses? Well, I would say the Winter Games, and I was lucky to go to the last one in Pyeongchang in South Korea, uh, covering freestyle skiing, snowboard, uh, that sort of thing. Uh, very different from being inside a pool, uh, for sure. But it's a bit of a smaller event. The Winter Olympics are not as large as the Summer Games. But otherwise, it's a, it's a lot of the same energy. Uh, you know, a, a lot of the same feelings of, you know, people coming together from all over, to kind of chase after a common goal. The hard work is the same. The sports are certainly different. It, it definitely is a, you know, a colder environment. It's a bit more out outdoors focus, that sort of thing. Um, depending on the sport you're, you're covering, the culture is a bit different too, right? Ice hockey, traditional team sport, you know, figure skating, there, there are team elements to it, right? But a, a bit more individually focused, uh, snowboard, freestyle, ski, those sorts of things. Similar, right? Team, uh, but individual elements. Also, though, a little bit newer, right? So there's that younger feel to it, you know, even though there are some veterans that are competing in, in it, as opposed to 
some of the stalwart sports that have been there forever. So it was a totally different experience, uh, but but a lot of fun. Um, I, I've always tried to look at all of these sports, whatever I'm calling or covering from both sides of it. Uh, I, I've worked in media for a long time, you know, behind the scenes in television and then on camera and I've done radio and a bunch of other things. And so whether it's, you know, helping in the coverage of these water polo athletes or calling a game myself, you know, I, I, I know both sides of it. And I always try and look at it like what's going to help the other side as they're trying to cover this thing. Uh, so if someone's trying to tell a story about a water polo player for the U.S. and I can try and help them help them tell that story, I have a good idea of what they're looking for. You know, what's going to make this two minute news story work well for the local station, or is this a bigger piece? Is this going to be a five minute feature on CBS or the Today Show or something like that? And so what do they need? What are the elements? Uh, because conversely, when I'm calling a game or doing an event and I'm the one tracking down the interview to talk to someone or asking them questions in a mix zone, I always think, well, what would I like to know in that scenario? Or what, what would it be that I want to ask somebody? Uh, and so that's been fun. It's been uh, a strange mixing of those worlds, but uh, it's it's been great to kind of have, especially as, as as these things have just really merged so much more when it comes to content creation and all of that. You know, there used to be very defined lines. You know, even before my time, you go back years ago, where it was this is over here and this is over here, and now it's uh, kind of all jumbled together. And so, um, the more versatile you can be, the more understanding of I think what everyone's trying to accomplish in their storytelling. Uh, the better it is for the athletes, right? That's what we're here to focus on. We're trying to tell their story and highlight their efforts and all that sort of thing. So, um, you know, the the more complete of a job we can do on that, I think uh, the better it is for them, for the fans, for everybody. I, I think you said that really wonderfully that we certainly recently with social media, with technology growing, um, with with how we tell stories really changing drastically in the last five to 10 years you have seen those two sides connect and converge um, because, because before that it, it, it wasn't me, right? It was very black and white. And now there's this huge gray area where you are telling the story. You're the one telling the story, but you're also the one procuring the story and speaking with the athlete. And um, what, what appealed to you about doing, being on both sides? Well, I, I think broadcasting has always been uh, my my number one love and the thing I you know I've I've been after since I was probably 13 years old. So it's you know it's something I've I've always been into. Uh, we were joking at the top, but it's true. I one help of of it being made very clear that I was nowhere near an elite level athlete as a high school kid or a middle schooler was I could really change gears quickly. Right there was no. There's no fantasy of playing a sport in college. And so uh, you can put that out of your mind and then get into the other stuff, right? And and for me, that was writing and reporting and broadcasting and that sort of stuff. Um, and we're, we're just hitting on it. It's kind of like minor league baseball in a way, my, my involvement with water polo in that, you know, so often you kind of broadcast about the team, but you also – kind of promote the team in a way as well. You're, you're kind of sharing some of the content, you know, you're working on the videos, the interviews, that sort of thing. Um, and so that's really how those kind of worlds just kind of naturally merge together. Um, but it's been fun too. you know, I never want to feel like I'm just doing one thing, you know, so it's great to as much fun as I have in the aquatics community, you know, and I, I covered some diving in Rio as well, uh, talking to some of those uh, athletes, after uh, their events there, um, both at the indoor venue and then at the outdoor one, uh, which was an interesting facility as well. Some might remember the green the green water there in Rio. So that's uh, that was unique. But um, being able to go out and cover and call college basketball or the new fan controlled football league or the Winter Olympics, right? Um, it's just fun to you know to not just be one thing and not and not be pigeonholed and to be able to bring that energy and excitement to a variety of mediums. And that's still what I'm after. Um, that, you know, we were talking about it earlier, right? You feel like you've done some good things as an athlete. What keeps you going forward? There's still more to do. And it's the same for me. There's still a lot of things on the bucket list to to call and to cover. Um, it's been fun so far, but it's, you know, it's going to be more fun to kind of continue to keep doing those things. 
I'm in the same boat with you there. I, my job with swim swam allows me to wear a lot of different hats um, and, and, and diversify my portfolio and what I'm doing, who I'm interacting with, but it's all in swimming. Thinking about do, doing that with another sport uh, gives me heavy anxiety just because it's good. You should, you, I highly recommend it. Um, put yourself outside your comfort zone and try something different. And, uh, you'll be pleased, I think, with how you respond. I think the skills are there and uh, it's a little, it it keeps things fresh. It keeps you from getting stale. I think we should always continue to keep learning how to do something new. Uh, someone could call me today and say, could you call some sport that I'd never even heard of? And I would say yes. And I would figure out what that sport was because uh, that's a good way to kind of keep expanding your mind and moving forward. So. Uh, obviously you do great work with the swim world, but yeah, if you can dabble in somewhere else, I think you'd be pleased with the results. I, I, I love that advice. And that, that was, that was leading into what I wanted to know is that were you, I mean, you mentioned you played basketball, obviously you work with USA water polo now, but you, you cover, you call so many different sports. Did you ever have that one sport that you were a huge super fan of or passionate about, or was it always just sports generally for you? I mean, I've always liked all sports. Basketball is certainly uh, my my favorite game just from playing it growing up and still being involved. And so I still do uh, college basketball today, um, Manhattan College uh, on the East Coast, and then the MAC, their conference. I've, I've done their tournament a bit and um, some other teams over the years. But really anywhere, as I've gotten more into this too, and you know, you probably see this as well, it's it's super important to not – say you're just one thing. I mean, I think you can be very successful that way too. Uh, but it's, but it's very challenging if you're, it's very limiting. If you're just going to say, I'm only an NFL guy, or I'm only a person who wants to cover major league baseball. That's all I do. There's certainly value in being an expert in just one thing. And if it's big enough, like those things are you, you know, you can just do that. Um, but I don't know. I just always, I always enjoyed kind of the breadth of it all. I mean, I, Certainly basketball, great. The NBA, love watching it. College basketball, all those things. But college football, the environment there, the passion, talking about passion of fans, that's fantastic. Olympic sports, whatever it might be. Winter sports, summer sports, swimming, diving, water polo, right? Skiing, uh, volleyball, I've come to love. Uh, indoor as well. Um, soccer. The storytelling environment, right? And especially covering a game, you never know what's going to happen. I think that's the joy of especially doing play by play for sports in that the ending is unknown. It's, it's unwritten. Um, I did improv comedy for a long time. And one of the things I enjoyed about that was that you were creating the story as you went. So there was no script. We had a very loose thing to work with. And at the end of 30 minutes, you presented to the audience a thing you created as you went. And that's a bit how calling sports goes. You're not creating the events on the field or in the pool or on the court, but you are documenting them and you are writing a story as you go. And uh, for me, that's very exciting. It's very uh, engaging. There's a, a bit of a high wire act to it of trying to say the right thing in the right moment. But when all of those things stack up correctly uh, and, and you get a great moment, it's hard to beat. It, it really is. And I would guess, having never been a good athlete, that for me is the equivalent of touching the wall at the right time or crossing the finish line at the right time or making the winning basket. Uh, that's, that's where I went for those things. Yeah. As you were saying that I was getting that visual of like, yeah, that, that is, that is the peak. That's what you work towards. And then that's, that's the payoff of, 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 of getting that euphoric moment when it all comes together. And it's like training, you know, you don't always, you know, for, the swimmers that we watched over the last year that were swimming in lakes or trying to find a pool to go hang out in. That's the grind that no one's really all that interested in, except for the ones that are in it, but you have to do it to get to the moment when you win the race and then get to the top of the podium. Uh, and it's a bit similar in broadcasting. You do a lot of games that are 40 point blowouts or that are over by halftime or that don't have much interesting to ha that happen at all because you are putting in the work to be ready to tell the story at the right moment or to chronicle the big event when it happens. And then you get some cool things along the way, uh, 
you know, Sean White winning gold in the half pipe or an NCAA championship buzzer beater or the first season of a brand new football league no one ever heard of, right? And those are the moments that come as a result of the work that came before it. I think that's, <laughs> I think you said it wonderfully again. I think that's a great note to end on, Greg. It's, it's been so great talking to you, not only getting the 411 on water polo heading into these Tokyo Olympics, but also your journey as, as a broadcaster and sports media personality. Um, it, that, it personally, that, that, that really got me, my juices going. I'm, I'm inspired now. I want to go, great. I want to go tell these stories uh, of, of swimming and beyond. Um, but again, thank you so much for taking the time to sit down and chat. I really appreciate it. Any parting thoughts before we sign off today? No, I don't think so, Coleman. Uh, been been good to talk with you, and uh, you know, appreciate you taking the time. And uh, thanks everyone for listening. If you're still here with us at this point, you're uh, you are much appreciated. And uh, we'll we'll be talking to you soon uh, from some sporting event, I'm sure. You've been listening to the Swim Swam podcast. Stay tuned for new episodes every week. You can take Swim Swim Podcast on the go by subscribing on your favorite podcast platform. Look for links in the description below and be sure to subscribe to our YouTube channel for more videos as well.